Welcome in to another edition of uh, Old Crimson Cougars podcast. This is not the Old Crimson one. I mean, because it's got we got two young, good-looking guys on it. Finally, for God's sakes, we kicked Sorensen and Jim Moore off the uh, podcast. Uh, it's brought to you by Cougar Collective, your home base for all NIL opportunities, uh, connecting student athletes, uh, fans, business owners and uh, student-athletes, helping student-athletes on and off the field. You can join the 1890 Club for as little as $18.90 a month. You can certainly give more. Uh, you can uh, make a one-time donation if you'd like. Also, drink the Old Crimson Legendary Lager, brewed by Pike Brewing. Sales benefit the Cougar Collective. Visit CougarCollective.org. Uh, also, Flat Stick Pub, Cougar-owned and operated. They've got six amazing locations across the state. Uh, Kirkland, Pioneer Square, South Lake Union, Spokane, Bellingham, and Redmond. Uh, visit FlatStickPub.com. No Jim Moore. I think he forgot about it. Didn't think we were going to do it because there was a buy. That's okay. And then also Paul Sorensen. I think Paul's flying. So we got the one and only, the talented, and all we need, Jamie Vinnick from CougFan.com, who joins us, by the way, every week anyways, but he gives us uh, a practice report. But now he's here for the full shindig. What's up, Jamie? How are you, man? I appreciate the promotion. I'm great. Uh, you know, like you said, it gets, uh, gets a little younger on here without the uh, uh, the, the two usual gentlemen. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, well, those two, those two putzes. Well, we don't. And here's the deals. Now we're we're going to be free from yelling and swearing as much as we do normally. Well, that's just without Paul. I mean, I mean Jim probably contributes a little bit, but <laughs> <laughs> he gets he contributes a little bit. He does, but it's uh, you know he gets real potty mouth, you know, you know a lot, and it's it gets nauseating. Well, I just like to say what I really like to do is just set those two up and just have them yell at each other as much as possible not and hard. then they you know it's good it's a it's it's what i like to do i just like them getting mad at each other uh non-stop hey let's uh i want to jump in eight games they got four games remaining seven and one you you evaluate you cover the team for kookfan.com evaluate them after eight games and and where they're at here with four games left in the season yeah i mean i think um has it been pretty no have i written four different uh post-game stories expecting a loss with about seven minutes left yes have they won all of those games? Yes. So, uh, I mean, San Jose State, Apple Cup, uh, Fresno State, San Diego State. My first story that I write after the game, I started framing as a loss right up until they decided, nope, it's not a loss, and we want you to rewrite this, which I was happy to do. But, you know, I, I think when you look at it, no, it hasn't been the prettiest 7-1. Uh, and one. It's maybe not like it was during the Minshew year when, A, they were beating better teams, and, B, you know, they were really running over some teams that they should be running over. Um, whereas you look at this year and it's like, okay, you had to squeeze it out against San Diego State, San Jose State, and Fresno State, but those are two road games in there. And we, I think we've talked about Fresno State is not an easy place to win. San Diego State, you know, it's there were a lot of factors that made that game tough, whether between the Aztecs were coming off a bye, you're playing on that god-awful surface, which you're not familiar with, and San Diego State has been a better team the last couple of weeks. Again, they still only beat Hawaii and Wyoming by three, but they're not the same team that Oregon State shut out week one or week two. So it, was it a game that the Cougars should have won by two touchdowns? Yes. I, I no, dis, no debate there. But I think after a season in which we saw them find ways to lose seemingly every week, whether that be missed field goals, uh, inept offense, inept defense, turnovers, you name it, it's refreshing to see them say, hey, we're just going to find ways to win. And that's, you know, been a cut now two really big plays by the defense. Uh, obviously, you had the material three big plays by the defense, including the Apple Cup. You had the material late drive and the Janikowski boot against San Jose State. So it, it's just they're finding a way. And at the end of the day, it, it's not necessarily pretty, especially on the road. But, you know, the final numbers are all that matters. And that's one team has more than the other. And they've been on the, the right side of that now seven times. I, I think, you know what, <clears throat> Cougar fans will get it. We'll, we'll, well, they'll hear this. And maybe if it's if it's me saying it, they'll they'll they won't get as angry. I mean, I think it's safe to say if they were in the Pac-12 or they're playing a better schedule, this team's not going to be seven to one. No, I mean, I, and it and it's okay to say that. That that's not saying that they're a bad football team. I don't think they're a bad football team, but they are being propped up because of of who they are, are playing, um, and because there are some there's some issues with these guys. You know, they they're not. I've been a little surprised, especially in all Jamie in all the games in, against the Mountain West teams. Their inability to consistently push them off the line of scrimmage. 
And to me, that's the, and, and in every game, do you pick them? They, they have not, I'm going to go back and look at all of them, but I don't think they've consistently been able to run the football, the running backs per se, not so much John material. I'm going to take John out of it for a second, whether they're design run plays or, you know, off script line up and blow them off the ball. I thought I would see more of that. And, and I haven't, haven't seen that in those mountain West matchups. Yeah. And I think, and I, I agree. I, I think that is one thing that, you know, I think a lot of us probably expected that they were going to be able to rack up six, seven sacks a game with ease. Mm-hmm. And they would just destroy these offensive linemen and that they'd be able to run it down their throats. And obviously that hasn't happened. And that is something that I think in fairness it is a concern. You know, you'd like to see them be able to bully some of these uh, opposing lines. And I do think that the last two weeks, especially we've seen the pass rush be a lot better. You know, it's, it's still not getting home as much as I think we'd like to see, but, it's starting to become an impact. I mean, Ansel dinbu has got four and a half sacks in the last yeah. two weeks. You're starting to see them disrupt the quarterback a little bit more. That said, you would like at this point for them to be, you know, registering five, six, seven, eight sacks a game. And for this to have been where they were at the start of the season. So they're just kind of behind in that. And I think uh, Schmetting deserves credit. He's kind of re-schemed uh, some of the blitz back just because it became clear they weren't going to just win one-on-one matchup straight up, which goes to your point of, they should be able to win those matchups. They're not, you know, that's got to be a place where they grow. And, um, you know, I think Cougar fans also probably were a little bit spoiled with the two edges that we've seen the last four years where it didn't matter who you put across them. We mm-hmm. saw those guys school Wisconsin defense or offense alignment. You know, we saw them school, the Washington offensive tackles last year and the Huskies had to hold on for dear life just to, you know, keep Penix upright. Of course, those weren't called, but I digress. Um, so I do think it has been a little disappointing to see them not just impose their will at the line of scrimmage. Uh, but I also think, you know, they're still kind of hopefully growing in that regard. And again, I think we've seen the progress a little bit on the defensive line. The offensive line, it's interesting to me because I think you've got your strength really on your left side. And I think when you that's running behind Pole, that's running behind uh, Hillborn when he's been in there. Mm-hmm. You know, I think uh, Fa Moe is still kind of getting back at right tackle. Dew's a little bit up and down there. Like, he was great against San Diego State, wasn't as good against Hawaii and against uh, Fresno State. You know, Kalani's solid. Again, maybe not all not an All-American, All-Conference, but he's fairly reliable, wasn't great against San Diego State. I, I think with the running game, they just they have to go off tackle. It, like, every if you watch any time that Sean Parker has gotten free, it's going off tackle. And, and there's mm. numbers to support this, specifically behind Pole. You know, the inside runs with Parker, that's just not his style, and it's not working because, as you're saying, they're getting pushed back a little too much really at that point of attack. Yeah, I, I think it's really evident, too, when they when they run to the tackles. It, it generally feels like Parker gets more of a push or more of a lane when they run out of the pistol. I think we've talked about that before. Mm-hmm. You know, when they when they run out of that traditional kind of RPOs game, and and they run him inside that he just doesn't in the RPO in general you just don't get a lot of push a lot of momentum going forward out of that and so I don't think he's as good as that depth to that I I bet you you know if Dylan Payne were back Dylan Payne actually would be the perfect running it feels like the perfect running back for that RPO game because I just think he's quicker to that hole right on the inside um, I like them incorporating the RPO stuff because and I know it's not true air raid because it does take advantage of your quarterback that can pull it and rip it if he wants and take off. And, and I, we haven't seen a ton of that w- from him. And I don't know if they're like holding him off from doing it because he has taken a lot of shots. I wonder if in the final four games, maybe they ramp that up a little bit. Yeah. And, you know, and I think the other problem with the RPO and trying to get the run game going out of that is defenses see that and they're just, they're swarming because they're banking on either Parker's getting it or Matir's getting it. You know, the, right. the key part of the RPO seems to be kind of the the third option. That In all likelihood, sure. it's going to be a carry for one of the two. And, and I think that's why, as you mentioned, you know, when they're out of the pistol, um, you know, pro football focus uh, measures effectiveness to each side. So when Parker goes around left end, so that's outside of pole, outside of the tight end, whoever's lined up there, uh, he's got 13 carries for 115 yards. When he goes off left tackle, so between Pole and the tight end, 10 carries for 71 yards. You look at the other side, right end, 5 for 17. Right tackle, 9 for 8. So that 
those lanes to the left side is where he has been at his best. The other place he's been fairly efficient is uh, right between Dew and Kalani. He's got 25 for uh, for 126 in that uh, in that lane. That's kind of his most common running lane. But that's also where the defensive tackles are and where the teeth of the line is. And just the way teams play Washington State, they're starting to push up a little bit because they know the quarterback draws likely. They know that they want to establish the run. So that's, I think, why you see a lot of the inside runs. They just don't seem to work as much. Um, but I do think there's also a little bit of truth that, you know, Matier's taken a lot of shots. I mean, I I wrote this uh, this weekend. I think the quarterback draw is a good play occasionally, not two to three, four, five, six times a drive. You need two yards from the two-yard line? Yeah, give it to – snap to Matier, let him run through someone. But on second and 10, that's not going to get you 10 yards. You know, yes, maybe once every 10 plays or every 10 tries. You know, obviously we look at the one against Washington in the Apple Cup where it's 30 mm-hmm. and 20. They run that for 25 yards. I think that was more because Steve Belichick mindlessly decided to zero blitz that play, which thank you very much. We appreciate that. But I think the the quarterback draw, which is what gets him hit the most. I mean, he, he I think he was a little nicked up even after the game. He took some hard hits against San Diego State. Probably a good time that there's a bye week. But, you know, uh, he I mean, he said that he was hurting a little bit after the, the last time he ran the ball right before the whole punting uh, episode. But. Just the, I, I think it can't be a, hey, we need to run this. We need to get him his touches on the quarterback draw. He needs to be running on scrambles or you know, run a, run an option, like run a, a, like a legitimate option if you want to get him using his legs. But the quarterback draws up the middle. Those are what getting him hit. It's what, it just doesn't work very well Got because it. teams have scouted it. I'd love to see an old school speed option with him. Mm-hmm. To the short side. Yeah, I want. <laughs> I wonder if he's ever ran it. I'm curious if his time back in Texas when he was playing high school football. I wonder if he's uh, he's ever run it because I understand Arbuckle's dilemma on this one, Jamie, because he is their most explosive offensive weapon, and he's mm-hmm. so dangerous with his legs that there is this. You know, when you get in a bind and you got you like, oh, I, I we need something right now, and that and that quarterback draw is just so tempting. He looks down on his play sheet. He's like. I know that can get me some yards. It, it's got to be. It, it's got to be a hard balance for Ben Arbuckle not to call it more. Right, and, and I think, and, and I'm not saying for them not to call. It. There's absolutely a time, but you'll see them call it on a second and ten. And that, yeah. to me, that's just not the time. That means you are saying, "Hey, run through the middle of the defense and get me six, seven yards to set up a third and short." You, you know, third and three. You want to run that? Okay, I, I, I'm okay with that. I think it's at its best on like a second and two where, all right, if he gets stuffed, you got to, you live another play or a first and goal from the four. But you know, the problem with you running on first and 10, if he gets stuffed, now you're in second and long, you run it on second and eight, he gets stuffed, you're in third and long. So it it just, it's got to be about, I think the, the spot and you know, and if there's something in the defense where they're backing off or they're doing the rush three drop eight, absolutely. But Teams aren't doing that because they know the threat. You know, the line, there's always a linebacker watching Mateer. No one's just letting him run free anymore. There is always someone spying him, and teams are keeping their defensive tackles on the interior purely to clog up the lanes and let the linebackers get there. So it's got to be, when you run that play, you have to be okay with getting two to three yards because a lot of times that's the most you're going to get, and sometimes that's all you need. But again, first and 10, you pick up two, all right, you're second and eight. That doesn't help you a whole lot. You get eight yards on first down. You have second and two. Okay, run the QB draw, see if you can move the chains. If not, you just need two yards on third down. So it's it just got to be, I think, a little more selective with when they run it. Yeah. The um, the the running game I- itself, I mean, right, there is a – there's a real give and take with establishing a run. I mean, listen, they, they run the air raid and it's a, it's an, they want to pass the ball and and that's their identity. But when you want to establish a running game, Jamie, you, you've got to be consistent with it and it takes patience, but it's hard, right? It's hard for a play caller uh, to stay patient with handing the ball off. You see it at any level. I think you see it with Arbuckle. I think you've seen it with Ryan Grubb and his transition from college to the NFL and it's you get one or two plays that don't work, right? 
He uh, goes one, one or two yards. You just as a play caller say, I'm done. I'm giving up. We're going to throw the ball. And and I wonder if that happens. I just think that a guy like Wayshawn Parker, you know, he needs more than, you know, nine or ten carries. I mean, it's it's like the 15th, 16th, 17th carry that when he probably now finally gets into a rhythm. Right. And I don't know if they're built to do that. I don't think they're built to do that. No, I think you're probably right. And and I think it's not fun to try and establish the run game for what you just said, because <laughs> the first four carries might go for three yards. But if you look at the best running backs in the league, both college and the NFL, I mean, even look at Genty, as unbelievable as he is, and he's obviously different, but so many of his yards come because he just breaks one. I mean, we right. look at the game between Wazoo and Boise State. I think at the half, he had like nine carries for 22 yards, and then the one big one or on, the, on the first drive of the game that he just breaks free. You look at, you know, in the NFL, you look at Derrick Henry. Derrick Henry is going to have seven, eight carries a game where he gets two yards, and then he's going to break three for 40, and that's where the yards come from. So I, I think it is tough. I think it's tough for a coordinator, especially one that is so used to passing. And again, this could apply to both Arbuckle and Grubb because sure. we're seeing the same thing with Grubb. Yeah, it takes a couple times for Ken Walker to get into some space. Again, you're talking about not a very good offensive line with the Seahawks. Yeah. And you're talking about one that I think has been up and down with the Cougs, especially on the interior. But no, they, there has to, I think, be more of an insistence on running the ball. And I think there has to be an understanding. And I think this will come with time as Arbuckle grows as a play caller. But if the first three runs go for negative one yard, you can't just abandon it. You have to be able to. And it's not even so much that, oh, eventually he'll break free. But you have to keep defenses honest. The number one thing that killed them last year is teams realized that they were not going to run the ball. A, because they didn't, they just, there wasn't a commitment to it. They couldn't block it well enough. B, because Nikita Watson wasn't good enough to get 20 carries a game. Uh, and C, because it just it didn't work, and they were often playing from behind. They need to start throwing the ball. You've got Cam Ward. You're going to put the ball in his hands. Right. So I, I think it's it's different this year, and they don't have a lot some of those same issues. Parker's a lot better than Watson. I think the offensive line's better. There needs to be, you know, again, I, I don't know if we need to be talking 30 carries a game like Genty, but 15 carries or even 15 to 20 touches get him four to five screen passes the way they used to use Borgie I mean that yeah. was as effective as anything that's been the one thing um as they made the transition away from Leach in this style of offense and you know it looks a little bit different to where then we went to Morris and now and now to Arbuckle one thing I've noticed about the way these guys call the air raid none of them use the two backs anymore Mm -mm. And the one thing that Leach was so good at, he'd have both. He would, basically, he didn't reinvent this. He, he took the West Coast offense and put it in shotgun. Yep. I mean, that's what he did. He had split backs, and he had split backs now with a quarterback, not under center, but he's just in shotgun now. But he ran the same stuff. And he ran the same stuff to where he had both those running backs who were good at catching the ball out of the backfield, and they were weapons. And And I don't see them throw the ball a lot to these running backs. Maybe they're not built that way. I, I don't know. But they don't seem like when, when Leach's offense was rolling, right, and you had that three-headed monster where it was, you know, Wicks and Morrow and, and Borgie, it was Morrow and, and Borgie were the more pass-catching guys. Well, Wicks could do a little bit of it. They were threats. And you get those guys on linebackers. I mean, most linebackers aren't able to cover a running back like that. Wicks, Morrow, and Williams. i got to correct you there. Borgie oh, Wicks, Morrow, and Williams. That's right. Thank <laughs> you. Thank yeah, you. Borgie was the next year with Williams. That's right. But uh, either way, you know, and no, you're absolutely right in that the, the you look at the receivers in total, the, the pass catching this year or the running backs, they've got eight total catches. That's it. Yeah. And the, those have gone for 85 yards. But like, I think 58 of those were on the one there. 52 was the one big Parker play against Portland State. So they aren't really incorporating that. And it, it is weird to see because it is such a weapon. Now, I think part of it is they have tried it a few times and it hasn't worked. I mean, mm -hmm. I remember, I think it was against, I can't remember if it was against San Diego State or Fresno State. They ran one to Parker. They try and get the blockers out. Everyone whiffs and it's like a loss of two. So mm -hmm. I think it's probably something that they're going to have to incorporate in the offseason. I don't think you're going to be able to overnight say, all right, we're a screen team now. But I do think that is something that they need to start to utilize. 
way Sean Parker is at his best in space. He is yeah. elite at making guys miss. There is your opportunity. You get him in the open field, let him make a couple guys miss. He's not going to make two, two defensive tackles and two linebackers miss in the teeth of the offensive line. Uh, I think to, you might have it. You might have it up in front of you if you got if if you have Pro Football Focus up in front of you. But I mean, like I I'd like to know just off the top of my head, you know, part about establishing the running game or you know getting that screen game working is they feel to me like do you know off the top of your head what what they usually face on third down? What's their third down to go average? Because for me, it always feels like it's third and long. It does that, feel like that. I that don't they're know never in a third and that. short, that they're never really in a third and short situation. No, and I think part of that is because, A, a lot of times when they pass on first down, they get first down because they throw yeah. those two, uh, you know, those seven, eight-yard seams that go for 14, which yeah. they need to do more of. That's their most effective offense. Or because on first down, they try and go quarterback draw, it doesn't work, or they throw a deep bomb and it doesn't work. I mean, I, I think we saw this in – absolute perfect demonstration against San Diego State. The first two drives, they got the ball out quick. They threw quick hitters. They got the ball in the hands of their playmakers. They made plays. From drive, whatever it was, two or three, until the middle of the fourth quarter, they stopped doing that. Every play, it's and, and that's a generaliz generalization, but quarterback draw, slow developing deep ball, this, or, and then finally it's, uh-oh, we're down 12. Let's go back to what works. And, I mean, I had written an entire piece on they had scored like 49 points per game on the road and like a or, – or, excuse me, 49 points per game at home and like 16 on the road. Mm -hmm. And then suddenly it's – they go back to what's work, what works. And you look at the two scoring drives. Quick to Williams. Quick to Hernandez. Mateer scrambles. Not on a draw. So I, I think that's the way that the offense has to work. And when they do that, they don't get in third and long because this offense just isn't structured that much to get a third and 12 because Mateer isn't the big deep bomb quarterback like a Cam Ward maybe was. Like, you know, you go back to Falk or Minshew or Gordon, et cetera. He's at his best when you look at a third and five and a defense has to prepare for a multitude of different options. Third and eight, they're pinning their ears back. They're coming hot because they know Washington State's probably going to try some kind of deep crosser and not the quick out route, the quick hitter to the seam, something like that. But I don't have the numbers in front of me, but no, it's a lot of third and long, mm -hmm. and that's when they struggle. When they're third and three, if they get there, they're pretty good because the playbook's open. What do you think has been, just thinking on the running game, what do you think the, the problem is from uh, Poole Lossie? Well, he just doesn't seem like the guy at the end of the year before he got injured, I'm just – or. Yeah, or came back from the injury, and I'm, I'm blanking on it. But I'm thinking of the Cal game specifically. Mm -hmm. Like there was just was some flashes from him. He looked explosive and fast, and and there was a lot to like. And I had big expectations, you know, for him with without even knowing anything about Parker. Then he gets banged up, and you're like, oh my god, he's gonna, you know, he's gonna, you know, he's gonna miss the first part of the season. Is it just still getting over that injury for him? That's my guess. Yeah. If I had to guess, I just think he's probably. A little hesitant, maybe, you know, again, he missed all of his summer workouts. So yeah. all that summer where you're just in the weight room getting stronger, you know, uh, adding your speed. He missed all that because he was rehabbing. My guess is if this is just one of those injuries and you see it all the time where, yeah, the guy comes back, he can play, but it's just not quite there yet. It takes another year or so for him to really get back to, to full speed, to fully being ready to go. That's kind of my interpretation because... No, the guy we saw against Cal ran with, <laughs> with no fear. He said, right. I'm running right into the middle of the defense, and I'm going to fall forward and get five yards. I remember the big talking point was, where has this guy been? Right. We're watching you know, Watson and at that time Jalen Jenkins get you two yards of carry. Why has this guy not gotten more carries? And he was banged up through some of the last season. But I, I tend to think that that injury that he suffered in the spring, the, the broken, I think it was a broken leg, was the, mm -hmm. the unofficial or official diagnosis, has just slowed him down a little bit to where he's still trying to kind of get his feet under him. You know, maybe there's a little bit of that, that, that hesitation of you don't want to take another hit like that and so on. So I, I would think that, you know, if we're having this conversation this time next year about Pulawasi, I'd say, okay, maybe it just, it, it's not going to come together. But I, I think. You know, he, it's probably just taking him a little longer to get back, not only physically, but kind of the mental side of things as well, after suffering a, a pretty, you know, painful injury. 
I feel like the, this episode has been all about the uh, the running game in the trenches. I, I just want to stay there. I, I just quickly glanced at, at next year's class. I believe, just updated on at Coug Fan, they have 17 known commits. Only one offensive lineman. Like, does does Jake and his and his staff have a philosophy where they want a minimum number amount of offense linemen a year? Yes, it's not Leach where we're going to take thirty three offensive linemen. It's not Rolovich where we're going to take two. Although, granted, two of those guys, those two guys he took in that twenty twenty one class are both starters right now. Um, there's a couple factors in hand here, and the big one is this offensive line class around the country for prep recruits is not good. It's just, it is down across the board. And the one thing that this recruiting staff won't do is they won't reach. They're not going to say, we need five offensive linemen, no matter what, we'll take three guys that have no business playing for us. They they won't do that um, because they don't want, you know, quote unquote, dead weight guys on their roster. And they're still actively uh, pursuing guys. They had two guys visit for the Hawaii game. Uh, one just decommitted from Western Michigan, which is where he was committed to. So take with that what you will. Um, there, it's just, a, it's a tough prep class to really recruit because everyone is moving down from where they would normally go. The great example, there's a kid from Portland right now. He's committed to Washington. Georgia offered him a couple weeks ago. Georgia's not coming into Portland, Oregon in a normal class to get an offensive line recruit, unless right. we're talking about a top 10 kid in the, in the class. And this kid's a good player, but he's not wh- where Georgia would normally be coming into the Portland area. but. Because of that, some of the SEC schools, Big Ten schools, et cetera, they're having to come more towards Washington State's territory, California, et cetera, and, you know, not take reaches necessarily, but take guys that normally they wouldn't be looking at. Whereas now that puts, pushes Washington State down. And the one thing that the coaching staff has done is they have really started to dig into the Midwest, which is not a normal recruiting territory for them. But uh, this kid that the, just com- decommitted from Western Michigan, Liam Vaughn, uh, is out of Wald Lake, Michigan. Uh, they just got a linebacker commit, Jovan Clark, from Chicago. So they're kind of doing the whole uh, turning over every stone, finding any guys they can that can play. And Clark's a great example. You watch the tape, and the first thing that stands out is, wow, this guy defends screens in the mold of what K.J. Wright used to do for the Seahawks. And I'm not obviously comparing the two, but it's that same recognition that same kind of uh, attack of a screenplay. Um, and linebackers, the same thing. It, it's not a good class for prep linebackers. Okay. So there, this is one where I think they'll end up probably taking maybe a Juco guy or two. They'll probably add a transfer portal guy for depth. The other thing that's important is they don't hypothetically lose much off the offensive line. You know, Essa Pole is the only guy who is out of eligibility. Every other guy, both starter depth, that can come back. And I think that probably says, okay, we can be a little more uh, picky on who we take. It's not like our depth is gone. We need to refill with eight guys. So I would guess they'll get to probably three to four by the time signing day comes around here in a couple of weeks or a few weeks now. Um, Will they probably take a guy who's off the radar? I would say it's likely. I I think that they trust what they can find in offensive linemen and develop. I mean, Xavier Thorpe's a great example. He had one other, one two other offers uh, last year. He's already risen up to where he's fighting for uh, right tackle reps as, as the number two guy. Um, so they they are more willing to take some of the projects, the guys like the Dillards and the Lucas who need to put on that weight. Whereas everyone else is looking for, hey, this guy's six six three thirty. He's ready to play tomorrow. So what, uh, yeah, what, what do you think when it comes out on Tuesday? What, what do you think the college football playoff rankings are gonna are gonna have them? Oh. I'll go 20, I'll go 20, uh, 23. I think they'll get knocked yeah. a little in the, the, the strength of schedule ranking stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, just the schedule is going to hurt them. I mean, I know there's an outside shot. They could sneak in. It's going to take a, it's going to take a miracle. I mean, a, they've got to keep winning. Yeah. They're going to need Notre Dame to fall apart. They're going to need Boise state to, to probably keep going. Probably need I'm trying to think. Do you want Washington probably to knock off Oregon at the end of the year? Well, you do. Not you don't want to. You want them to. Yeah. Well, I mean, you do. I mean, if you yeah. want to get in, if you want to get in, you're going to need them. To, you're going to need them to look better than they have. Well, right. Yeah. No, <clears throat> that's probably true, unfortunately. But it, I don't think that's going to happen. So <laughs> it's a good point. But, I know. 
but uh, yeah, no, you'll, you you would definitely need some help. Some of these two loss SEC schools, LSU, yeah. Bama, Ole Miss, need to become three loss SEC schools. Yeah, they just don't have the. They just you know, it's, I mean, they just don't have the resume. They no, just don't. No, it's the, that's... it's the unfortunate part of Washington not being good, and you know, Texas Tech after looking really good for a while, yeah, eh, not looking so good the last couple of weeks, and then. You know, I think there was maybe some hope that Fresno State would have been better. Uh, right. Maybe San Diego, maybe the Beavs. But you know, the only, you know, the only bowl teams at the end of the year that they're going to have played could very well be Boise State and Texas Tech. That could be it. Yeah, yeah, uh-huh. you're you're probably right. Hey, before you go, I'm going to switch gears a little bit. You wrote about it up at Cougfan.com. I love these secret scrimmages that these basketball programs do. What I love even more is how they never stay secret. It's funny how that works, isn't it? Yeah, <laughs> everyone. Um, it, it to me at this point, I almost just say just open them up, and I think yeah, part of the, the reason is they they're they're toying with things, and that's basically what happened on on Sunday. They played yeah. Montana, they lost, but they didn't play the starter. I mean, Isaiah Watts didn't play, Coward and and Lawan and those guys they played a little bit, but it was a lot of hey, let's get twenty to twenty five minutes for. The young guys. Let's try a bunch of rotations that are never going to see the floor in the regular season. Let's just see what we have here. I mean, Montana had three guys foul out and they kept playing because I think David Riley said, it, it, just keep playing. You want to see what you guys have. What's the big deal? It's, this is a scrimmage. Um, you know, I think right. they, they attacked that Colorado State game like a real game. They, they played mostly the starters in the rotation. Um, and, and treated that like a legitimate game, and they won. They treated this like, hey, this is an experimentation. We are going to just see what we have on our roster, where maybe we can fit guys into the rotation, call it good on that, uh, and, and you know, walk away thinking, okay, we saw what we needed to see. That's all we needed. Um, and I think like, they were up like 15 in the first half and then just started to kind of, you know, toy or not like, you know, uh, joke around or take it, but see what they had and, and treat it kind of like a, like a glorified, you know, inner team scrim- scrimmage in a way. Jamie, what do you, what do you just being around the program, talking to some guys, what, what do you think the expectation of that team is going to be? Yeah. You know, I, I think it's, it's tough because I think everyone wants them to build off last year. Um, and, and what was, you know, a pretty, uh, unforgettable season. It's hard to really predict what these guys are going to look like you know because you take the four players from eastern okay that was a good team last year and then it's okay what else do we have in there does watts take the next step from a you know spark plug microwave off the bench to a legitimate you know nine to ten points per game guy is nate calmese the guy that was at lamar before mike hopkins ruined him you know that's i think he's one of the biggest x factors if he can average what 14 15 a game and be that's just lightning quick point guard it, it changes everything they're going to do because teams just then can't focus purely on Cedric Coward you know mm-hmm. what do the bench rules look like can Reeve Avers be a shooter off the bench can Okafor provide them the defensive post minutes you know can Eric Strip and Price you know handle some of the athleticism that they'll see in the WCC first what they saw in the big sky so I think they're going to be a good team I, I think 20 wins is probably in the cards. It's just, is it a 20-win NIT team? Is it a 20-win team that can sneak into the NCAA tournament? For that to happen, you probably need to have a pretty, you know, pretty clean non-conference and then probably need to get at least two games, maybe three against Gonzaga, Santa Clara, St. Mary, San Francisco. Yeah. Um, I think that's kind of where you're at. Hey, uh, lastly, what are you hearing about this store? You guys had it up. What are you hearing about this expanded beer sales in 25? Uh, yeah, that's, uh, I'll be honest, that one, uh, I did, was not involved in any of that conversation okay. reporting, so I only know what's in the story, just kind of about that they're hoping to, to push forward and so on, but uh, that was uh, that one did not involve me so much, so I, I can only say what was uh, uh, what was said in but the But it store. looks optimistic that they're going to get it done. I, I think there there is some optimism that this Good. might finally end that uh, that age old question of why is there no beer sales in Martin Stadium? But well, well, here's what I don't understand. Did you see the picture of Kirk Schultz had this past weekend with the CEO of Taco Bell? Yeah, that's. Uh, that, how do we not have an NIL deal with How do we not have an NIL deal with Taco Bell? For for those who don't know, the the CEO of Taco Bell is a former Wazoo basketball player. Yeah. <laughs> 
I mean, that should be that should be the great. It should be like when Man City was bought by uh, by the Et- uh, Etihad Airlines and then became a power. That's what happened to Washington State. Or when well, there, sh- when there should be a ta- yeah, there should be a Taco Bell in the concourse. There should the be one field the should be the field should be renamed after it. I mean, the Gordita Field. I don't know something. Yeah, no, yeah. There, there's got to be a way that they can get something out of Taco Bell to get some kind of NIL deal to you know, especially for. Keeping some of the every every college kid likes Taco Bell. Give give John. I love Taco Bell, Taco Bell, and I'm 48. I, I do too. I'm not 48, but give oh. John Matier unlimited Taco Bell for uh, as long as he's at Washington State. There you go. Great. He's never leaving. Be great. Now, uh, Jamie, are- before you go, tell tell everyone where they can find you on uh, social media and where they can read all your work. Yeah, I'm uh, on uh, Twitter or X or whatever you want to call it this week. Uh, Jamie Vinick Nine. That's J A M E Y. V I N N I C K, the number nine. And you can read everything I produce uh, at uh, kookfan.com, part of 247 Sports. He does it the best, man. He's, he's working his ass off all the time. Constant uh, stories and content up there at uh, kookfan.com. All right, Old Crimson Cougars podcast in the books. Uh, no Jim Moore, no Paul Sorensen. It was by far and away the best one we've ever done. There was and no I'm swearing. Just- there's no, well, it just was, co- it was. Here's the deal it was quality content by someone. Who actually knows about the football team? It, was it wasn't uh, wasn't two uh, two old guys just yelling about yelling at clouds. Yeah, uh, I can't work this. Well, yeah, it was wonderful. Good job. Uh, it's all brought to you by the Cougar Collective. Again, join the eighteen ninety club for as little as eighteen dollars and ninety cents a month. You can also make a one time donation. Go find in your stores the Old Crimson Legendary Lager. It's brewed by Pike Brewing. Uh, sales benefit the Cougar Collective. Uh, visit CougarCollective.org. Also, big thanks to Andy Largent and Flat Stick Pub. Six great locations across the area: Kirkland, Pioneer Square, South Lake Union, Bellingham, Redmond. Uh, Spokane uh, there as well. They've got you covered for date night, guys night, ladies night, large group event. Great for kids. Great place to watch the Cougs. Uh, Great food, great pizza, great beer, uh, great wings, great huckleberry ice cream, all of it. It's great. All of it's wonderful. Uh, Visit uh, flatstickpub.com. You can find Old Crimson Podcast up on YouTube. You can, of course, listen to it up on Apple, Spotify, wherever you find your podcast. And, of course, one-stop shop up at pucksports.com.